Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to AmeriCare's Essential for Health live stream. I'm Dr. Mikhail Varshavsky. Some of you may know me as Dr. Mike. I will be your host today. I'm a family medicine physician and proud AmeriCare supporter. I'm thrilled to see that so many of you have joined us during National Volunteer Week as we celebrate the dedicated staff and volunteers making good health possible for millions of patients at free and charitable clinics across the country. For more than 40 years, AmeriCares has been saving lives and improving health for people affected by poverty or disaster. And throughout this past year, we've all witnessed just how critical good health is to all aspects of development. With good health, people can attend school, be productive at work, care for their families, and contribute to strong communities. We've also seen that for too many people in the United States, good health is out of reach. And the COVID-19 pandemic has brought into sharp focus the health inequities that continue to persist today. But AmeriCares is working to change that. Here in the US, AmeriCares is the leading nonprofit provider of medical aid to the healthcare safety net, supporting a network of nearly 1,000 free clinics and health centers with medicine, supplies, education, and training. AmeriCares helps partner clinics increase access to high quality, comprehensive, and equitable health services for the uninsured. AmeriCares also operates the largest free clinic network in the home state of Connecticut, the AmeriCares Free Clinics. I've actually had the opportunity to see the AmeriCares Free Clinics in action and meet with some of the incredible staff and volunteers that are working every single day to increase access for care for the most vulnerable. Today, we'll get to hear from some of those dedicated individuals who are making good health possible in their community. But first, we have a special message from Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut. Connecticut has been a leader in the response during the pandemic and is now setting the example with its COVID-19 vaccination efforts. I'm pleased to introduce Governor Ned Lamont. I am so proud that AmeriCares is right here in Connecticut. I appreciate everything you're doing in terms of the free clinics for people in our state and the further afield. I think we found out during this last uh, year with COVID how important healthcare for everybody is. Nobody can be left behind. Some of AmeriCares do not have to be reminded. They've known that all along. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you so much, Governor Lamont, for that wonderful message. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists today. Joining me is Jen Da Silva, director of the Fred Weissman AmeriCares Free Clinic in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Jen, a registered nurse, has served as the director of the clinic since 2016, overseeing a bustling health center dedicated to providing quality care for the city's working poor. Jen has extensive experience as a nurse, having worked for Bridgeport Hospital and as an emergency travel nurse for hospitals in both Connecticut and New York. Next up, we have Dr. Ari Perkins, the volunteer medical director at the Bob McCauley AmeriCare's Free Clinic in Norwalk, Connecticut. Dr. Perkins began volunteering at the clinic in 2015, and as the volunteer medical director, he provides guidance on clinic policies, procedures, supports volunteer recruitment, and serves as an advocate without, with, within the community. While he is not volunteering, Dr. Perkins serves as an attending emergency medicine physician at Norwalk's Hospital Department of Emergency Medicine, where he has worked for the past 15 years. He is also the member of the AmeriCares Leadership Council and was the top fundraiser for AmeriCares at the 2018 New York City Marathon. That's really impressive. I can't run a marathon, so shout out to you for doing that. We also have Edith Lee, Vice President of the AmeriCares US program. Edith oversees AmeriCares health programming in the US and is responsible for designing and implementing innovative programs that expand access to care for millions of low-income patients. She also has extensive leadership in the health and human services sector, having worked as a licensed clinical social worker. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. And before we jump in, I want to remind that the chat will be open throughout the program. If you have a question for any of our panelists, feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, hopefully at the end, we have some uh, Q&A time. Um, but Jen, uh, I'd love to kick it off with you if you're open to it. What do you think? I think that's great. Let's go ahead. All right, let's do it. All right. Look, many of uh, the people that the American Free Clinic, uh, the AmeriCare's Free Clinic serve have been hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. How has the Bridgeport Clinic supported patients throughout this past year, 
and how did you, your staff, and volunteers adapt to ensure that you were meeting the health needs of your patients while keeping everyone safe? I think that's a really good question. Um, so many of us have been affected in one way or another by COVID, especially our patients. They have so many other issues affecting their day-to-day -day lives. And here at AmeriCares, our patients can't afford private insurance and don't qualify for state insurance. So you can only imagine how this has affected them, many of them being essential workers working really hard to make ends meet. Um, I'm very lucky and fortunate that I have a dedicated group of staff here who adapted really quickly during this challenging time. We assessed the needs of our patients and we discovered that it ranged from everything from hunger disparity or insecurity that was caused by loss of income due to COVID, access to care and medications, and also just having trouble navigating through this difficult health system. Um, you might also be aware a lot of our patients are non-English speaking, so this in itself presents another hardship. All these things together resulted in us developing and implementing the telehealth model. We created um, a, and disbursement of isolation kits for patients who tested positive for COVID or who were exposed to COVID who had trouble getting masks, gloves, and cleaning supplies for disinfecting. We arranged curbside medication pickup, grocery gift cards, and so many other creative ways that we came up with to, you know, um, be there for our patients in the absence of face-to-face -face interaction. What has been the feedback from the community in general to the AmeriCare's free clinics during this time? I think everybody's been very receptive. We know that this has been a very challenging time for everybody, and it's really been a sense of community. Everybody's just, how can we help? Yeah, that's amazing that um, you not only have that great rapport within the, the clinics itself, but also with the community as well. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Perkins, uh, I'm sure you've also had to adapt, not only with your work in the emergency room, but also as a volunteer at the Norwalk Clinic. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience in treating patients during this time? Yes, uh, yeah, and thanks, thanks Dr. Mike for doing this and appreciate the question. Uh, well, as you know, when COVID happened, this was just a really challenging time for all of us. Uh, it was a paradigm shift in how we thought about taking care of patients, um, both in the AmeriCare's free clinic and in the emergency department. Um, so, you know, as Jen touched on, we really had to do a transition to telehealth and our, our patients are, are especially vulnerable. And so we had to make sure that they were getting um, the appropriate care, getting the appropriate testing. And, and you know, as we moved through the pandemic, um, you know, helping our patients get vaccinations and um, get, get care, the same care that anybody else in our community in Connecticut would, would receive. And one of the things that I think that I, I deal with a lot as, a, as the clinic director is when recruiting physicians, is, and, and other providers is many people think that we have uh, limited tools in the toolbox um, to help our patients. And it, it's just not true. Do the amazing resources from supporters, uh, from our uh, collaboration with uh, companies and health uh, and hospitals, uh, we have amazing resources at our disposal to help these patients. And one particular example I'd like to give is uh, we uh, had a patient in the uh, in our in our Norwalk clinic system, who had pretty severe uh, initial COVID symptoms and was just pretty high risk. He had diabetes and hypertension, some obesity, and so Veronica, uh, who's our director at the Nor Norwalk clinic, called me and said, "Hey, is there what can we do? I, I understand Norwalk Hospital has monoclonal antibody, so we were able to actually arrange monoclonal antibody treatment when it was new." Uh, as a therapeutic uh, for COVID-19. And I think really helped turn the tide for this particular patient. And I was very proud of that. It's so impressive that uh, you're able to uh, really show the interdisciplinary care that uh, the patients at these clinics are able to get. Um, what has been your experience in working with the social workers, the nurses, the PAs, all of the frontline workers that continue to put in time day in and day out during a very uncertain time. 
Yeah, I can speak to that to the, you know, in my experience in the emergency department, we, we all sort of came together and all learned together how to handle this in terms of managing with PPE, uh, how to evaluate patients in, in a different way. Um, and obviously in the emergency department, we're dealing with a different level of acuity and a different volume. But in a lot of the same ways, those same experience were shared by our amazing volunteers in the AmeriCare uh, system where we all sort of learned together and we, we actually created a Zoom meeting on a, on a regular basis to discuss what we were doing well, what we could do better, and how to tackle uh, the challenges that we had. Um, so I think that constant coordination, communication, both in the emergency department and in the AmeriCare's free clinic uh, really helped us move forward uh, during this pretty tough time. Amazing coordination and full effect there. Um, Jen, you mentioned earlier how telehealth has uh, impacted your ability to do work throughout this pandemic, especially with those who have a barrier to uh, reaching their appointments, getting to their appointments due to transportation difficulties. You know, many of your patients are essential workers and may not have the luxury of taking time off from work to make it to their appointments. What have you heard about uh, telehealth from your patients and what impact has it had on their ability to get medical care? So telehealth has been a very integral part in the ability to ensure that the care that we give during the COVID period, um, it has been extremely beneficial to our essential workers, but it's been equally as important to our patients who've been faced with staying home with remote learning for their children or the patients who have transportation issues and can't make it to their appointments. So telehealth was meant to be a temporary solution that is by far exceeded temporary. Um, it's definitely one of our more permanent platforms now. And it has allowed patients to not miss work, not miss pay, um, be able to the flexibility to stay home and tend to their children. And at first there was a lot of hesitancy behind it, but then that quickly changed. For a lot of the patients, it's their preferred way of receiving care and giving that flexibility to work and to, to just be where they need to be. Um, people often ask me, like, how has telehealth been beneficial? And there's so many examples that I can give, but there's two that stick with me the most. Um, I had this 39-year-old female and she had called the clinic and said, I think I had gotten bit by an insect and my arm is really swollen. And, and it's red and I don't know what to do. And so she couldn't get to the clinic. Her children were remote learning. It was COVID period. She was scared to you know, come into the clinic and we arranged a telehealth appointment for her. And by looking at her arm, we saw that it was not a normal bite. It appeared to be uh, cellulitis. And we referred her to the emergency room. Later on, we follow up with her and we find out it's not only cellulitis, but it was compartment syndrome needed IV antibiotics, and then also needed a fasciotomy. And then bringing it back to COVID, like, uh, like Dr. Perkins has been saying, we had to really learn how to assess our patients in non-traditional manners. And so telehealth gave us the ability to do that. I had a patient who was COVID positive due to exposure, asymptomatic when we first had our first um, telehealth appointment with them. And we said, we're gonna follow up with you in a week. We just wanna see how you're doing. And during our video conversation, he, his color was off. He was having trouble just getting his words, appeared very short of breath. He had no way of getting to the emergency room, no transportation. We called 911 for him. And after touching base with the ED and you know with the staff who was involved in his care, his oxygen level was 76%. So Dr. Mike, you know that a normal oxygen level should be 93 to 100%. And so both of these patients are just really good examples of how we had to change and adapt because telehealth was a very big part of getting them the care they need and the access to care. And had we not had telehealth, these two patients would have had very dramatic different outcomes. I completely understand where you're coming from on that, Jen. Uh, you know, myself as a primary care provider, at some point we did have to switch for a period of time to solely delivering care through telemedicine. And while that was not perfect in many instances because you need a physical exam, you need patients to come in, 
it really truly bridged the gap and allowed us to be more adaptable during a time of need for our patients. So I appreciate you doing that and the services you offer to your patients. Um, Edith, how about um, from the broader free clinic network? What are you hearing from AmeriCare's partner clinics about the role telehealth is playing, not only for them, but for their patients as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, like many other healthcare systems, 67% of free and charitable clinics transitioned to telehealth services in response to the pandemic. Um, this rapid and unexpected push to telehealth services has allowed free and charitable clinic patients who again, um, as Jen was saying, are often frontline workers in the service industry to access healthcare more easily. Um, when an individual is an hourly worker without paid time off, they often have to make difficult choices, you know, miss work and not get paid for hours missed or attend a healthcare appointment. And telehealth enables patients to attend appointments during work breaks, allowing them to not only tend to their health needs, but also continue to provide for their families. Um, our AmeriCare's U.S. program recognized that with the rapid and unexpected push to telehealth services, free and charitable clinics could use assistance in implementing, sustaining, and, and even expanding telehealth services at their clinics. So we've been supporting a number of clinics with funding and telehealth training and, and technical assistance. That's amazing. Uh, Edith, can you tell me a little bit more what's going on in the clinics that AmeriCare support? Have they seen an increase in demand for services throughout the pandemic? Yeah, the pandemic has put stress on health systems. We know that. And this includes massive increase in the number of low-income uninsured patients served by free and charitable clinics and other safety net providers. Um, there are roughly 1,400 free and charitable clinics across the U.S., and they serve collectively um, roughly 2 million patients. And these numbers are rising due to significant job loss. Um, according to the National Association of Free and Charitable Clinics, in August, there was a 74% increase in patient demand at free and charitable clinics. And though this number has leveled off some, there's still a significant increase in need um, with 66% of free clinics stating that they continue to experience an increase in patients seeking care at free clinics. Well, that, that all goes to show why I'm such a proud AmeriCare supporter. Thank you for all the work, Edith, that uh, obviously has been done. Um, let's switch gears a little bit here for Dr. Perkins. Um, a lot of the amazing work that is carried out by the free and charitable clinics, it's powered by volunteers just like you. You've been volunteering at the AmeriCare's Norwalk Clinic since 2015, and you're the volunteer medical director. How did you get started as a volunteer, and what has this experience been like for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to point out first, I'm, I'm really just one of over 200 volunteers for our clinics that really make this all work. Uh, so... You know, I, I feel, it, you know, it's very special to be part of that AmeriCare's family um, and provide for these patients. So to, to answer your question, I, I first got introduced to AmeriCare's by Dr. Or by Carol Bauer, rather, um, who, who's an amazing philanthropist and was a former board member at uh, Norwalk Hospital and uh, started out as a supporter and then several physicians uh, who had been volunteering at AmeriCare's uh, free clinics uh, talked to me about it and I started volunteering my time. And I really just, you know, initially I had that sort of reservation that I would not have the access to certain tools and certain uh, you know, medications or, or testing that I wanted to get. And as the more I worked, the more I learned how, you know, how many uh, opportunities we have to work with uh, people, uh, other physicians in our community and hospitals and have all the resources we need to take care of these patients. And then perhaps the, the hook that really got me into it was uh, uh, one of my first few shifts. I, I took care of a, uh, a younger male patient. He came from Central America recently and he just didn't look well. He had a cough, uh, had lost a lot of weight. I was able to get him an x-ray make a long story short, he had a very rare fungal pneumonia. We were able to tr get him treated at a tertiary care center with uh, the appropriate uh, antifungals and antibiotics. And, and I saw him in follow-up, which as an emergency physician, I don't often have the opportunity to do. And he looked amazing. Um, and that was just such a powerful 
sort of uh, experience for me and really help propel me to continue my work with AmeriCares. <clears throat> That's amazing. That's amazing. How do you see this healthcare safety net play out for those who are uninsured? Are you seeing better health outcomes directly for these patients? Uh, without question. So I have the perspective of seeing patients in the emergency department that do not have, uh, you know, primary care, do not have healthcare screenings such as colonoscopy, mammography, don't have their diabetes cared for don't have their blood sugars checked on a regular basis, don't have their hypertension managed. All of that we do for AmeriCare's patients. And, and, I, and I know that we are preventing strokes, heart attacks, uh, cancers, all the end sequelae that you see from lack of primary care. Um, and so it's a great service to our patients. And I think it's also a really good service to our healthcare system and our community. And I think the reason that we get a lot of support from our, our partners, uh, because these are, you know, it just just from a financial standpoint, it's very expensive to take care of the all the end organ damage from that comes from not treating those chronic conditions. Completely agree. And uh, Dr. Perkins, you mentioned the support that AmeriCares receives. Edith, can you tell us a little bit about this support? Um, how does that uh, provide a safety net to ensure that these clinics can deliver the best possible care? Yeah, I think it's important to understand um, a little bit about the, the safety net, um, free and charitable clinics, to, to understand how important the support is. Um, you know, free and charitable clinics have been filling gaps in our nation's healthcare system for more than a century, and they receive little to no government funding and rely heavily on private donations or gift in kind. Um, they provide health services at no cost. Um, roughly one third of them have an annual operating budget of less than $100,000. Um, so through our access to medicine program, we focus on increasing access to safe, effective quality medicines and supplies for safety net health centers and clinics like free and charitable clinics. And these clinics serve the most vulnerable. So those who are low income, uninsured or underinsured, communities of color, um, immigrants and refugees and disproportionately affected groups. And by providing free medicine and supplies to these clinics, they're able to provide these medicines and supplies to their patients at no cost. Um, you know, we also design and implement clinic to community based programs to support sustained health improvements. So one example of our capacity building programs is our, our echo behavioral health integration program. So though free and charitable clinics, um, you know, their patients are able to receive free primary care services, access to affordable specialty care, such as behavioral health services can be problematic. And people need access to specialty care for their complex health conditions like, like behavioral health. And there aren't enough specialists or resources to treat everyone who needs care, especially in rural or underserved communities. So the, the ECHO program, which stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, this model trains primary care clinicians um, in under-resourced settings to provide best practice specialty care through video conferencing um, to provide mentoring and, and feedback from specialists. So together, they manage patient cases so that more people can get the care that they need. And through this program, patients get the right care in the right place at the right time, which improves um, outcomes and reduces health disparities. You're essentially empowering providers uh, like Jed and Dr. Perkins. Um, Jed, you are a holistic provider of care. You think about patients as a whole, uh, more so than just a diagnosis. You think about how they're gonna get to appointments, whether or not culturally we are competent to take care of these patients. We need to, um, as Edith said, connect them to specialty services. You know, the free and charitable clinics like the one you oversee are at the, front of, uh, at the forefront of this important work. Can you speak to the patients? I think you said it best, you know, we meet the patients where they are. We understand their situations. Um, our mission is to save lives and improve health care to those who are affected by poverty and disaster um, so they can reach their full potentials. And again, that's exactly what we do. We take the time to listen. We take the time to assess their needs. Um, 
and they trust us, they confide in us, and they know that this is a safe place. And that alone is just half the battle. The other times there's other solutions or other obstacles that are in our that are that we are faced with that we just don't have solutions for. Then we come together, we work collaboratively. Um, a lot of the times we'll go out into the community and work with our community partners. And sometimes we end up learning that we need to create new programs. But whatever the obstacle is and whatever the patients need, they know that the ask is not too great. They know we will go to lunch to get them what we need. And our staff here just don't know how to say no. So we're always looking for the yes. I've absolutely seen that firsthand and it's truly amazing to see. Um, along those same lines for Edith, uh, it's well documented that unstable housing, poor nutrition, poverty, and other factors, what we call social determinants of health, can worsen chronic conditions and have worse outcomes for those with uh, diabetes or perhaps heart disease. Uh, these conditions are also some of the most common among the patients that rely on free charitable clinics like the ones you oversee. Can you speak to the impact that a patient's social environment can have and what AmeriCares is doing to advance health equity? Yes, um, we know that a patient's health and well-being is influenced by, by several factors, uh, genetics, access to health care, social and environmental factors, and individual behaviors, right? So it's not as simple as just telling a patient that they need to be more active or take their medicines or eat better, because the reality is the choices we make are based on the choices that we have. Um, so consist, consistent access to medications to treat chronic conditions is essential. Um, a patient managing a medical condition like diabetes or hypertension must have access to these medications to live. And these medications are not optional, they are essential. So we recognize the importance of medicine security and our AmeriCare's access to medicine program is closing gaps in, in medicine medication access. In terms of health equity, we recognize that health is a human right. Um, AmeriCares believes that all people, um, irrespective of race, ethnicity, religion, sex, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, disability class, immigration status, um, all have a natural right to quality care and the opportunity to lead a healthy life. So no one should be denied care because of who they are, where they live, their income, or for any other reason. We also recognize that within the healthcare system, disparities do exist. Um, so AmeriCares in partnership with Loyola University and the National Association of Free and Charitable Clinics and hundreds of free and charitable clinic stakeholders across the country um, is leading a national initiative known as Roadmap to Health Equity. And the goal of Roadmap is to improve quality of care and reduce health inequities for patients served by free and charitable clinics. And we're achieving this through the development of a, a national standardized method of reporting patient health outcomes so that we can measure the care being provided by these clinics, determine whether there are any differences in the care uh, being provided to different populations, and then support clinics in addressing those differences. And quality care means equitable access to safe care, equitable access to effective care, care that's equitably efficient, patient-centered and timely, and we can't have quality without equity. Yeah, absolutely. That data is going to be crucial to guiding us to, towards the future. Um, Dr. Perkins, it's clear that um, community partnerships have play a critical role for you in eliminating unnecessary barriers to care, but also ensuring that the needs of uninsured patients are met. Can you talk to us about your experiences with some of these partnerships and how they allow you to improve the health outcomes for your patients? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the recipe that makes this work, right, is our volunteers and our supporters, and then it's our collaborations, our collaboration with our partners. And so I, our, our, our main partners, I, I, I would have to mention Quest as uh, providing amazing laboratory support, allowing us to, you know, for example, for our diabetics, continuing monitoring their glucose and HbA1c to make sure that we are treating them correctly and adjust medications appropriately. Um, and since the mid 90s, Quest has provided, I think something like $12 million in uh, charitable care to help support our patients, which is pretty amazing. Um, some of the other uh, collaboration that we have is through our partnership hospitals in the area, uh, providing specialty testing, 
And for example, if we need to get a stress echo on a patient who might be having some intermittent chest pain, or if we need to get a CAT scan uh, for whatever reason or an MRI, we have access to that, uh, which uh, again, is, is just uh, amazing to me to have those tools uh, available to, for our patients. Uh, we have uh, great specialists uh, who work with us in partnership. Uh, so uh, for example, dermatologists, ophthalmologists, GI, cardiology, that we're able to refer for patients that need a, uh, you know, a second opinion or another look, or maybe are a little bit more complex. Uh, all of this together really helps provide a you know, total holistic care for our patients and hopefully keeps them out of the emergency department uh, where we don't want them to go if they don't have to. Well said. Uh, you know, I'm excited for all the future that AmeriCares has in store. Um, Edith, what can we expect in the coming year from AmeriCares? Yeah, our, our AmeriCares U.S. program, we continue to look for ways to increase capacity and support for free clinics. And we have a great deal of respect and appreciation for our free and charitable clinic partners. And one of the reasons I think we've been so successful in addressing their needs is that we listen to them. Um, you know, these clinics know their communities and their patients, and we lean on them to inform our programmatic direction and decision-making. In the coming year, we will continue to support our clinic partners with focus on training and technical assistance, <laughs> quality improvement, and health equity. And I did want to mention that you know, none of this work would be possible, though, without the support of our donors, truly, um, on behalf of the AmeriCares U.S. program team and the free and charitable clinics across the country and the patients they serve, um, we do sincerely thank you. Well, thank you for that, Edith. Uh, I think we also have to go out and thank all of our volunteers for all the work that they've done as well. Um, I'd love to take some of your questions. A reminder that you could type them right there in the chat box to the right of the screen. We actually have a great question here for you, Edith. Um, as vaccines roll out across the country, what is AmeriCare doing to dispel myths and educate free clinic staff, volunteers, patients, family members about the importance of vaccination? That's a great question. Um, you know, the research has shown that in your doc, um, I know you know this, but there are specific factors that influence a person's confidence in the vaccine. So factors such as easy access to the vaccine, if getting the vaccine would facilitate getting back to school or work, um, if there's no cost to the individual, and whether the healthcare team communicates confidence in the vaccine, you know, including vaccine safety. Um, the stats show that eight out of 10 people state they would get the vaccine if their healthcare team recommended it. And according to the latest stats from Kaiser Family Foundation, um, their vaccine weekly vaccine monitor, 18% of front, frontline healthcare workers state they do not plan to get vaccinated and another 12% state they have not yet decided. So that tells us, you know, according to the CDC, um, you know, their current data suggests that 70% of the population will need to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity um, to coronavirus. So I say all that to say it's important that healthcare personnel stay informed. Um, they need to receive up-to-date and accurate information about the vaccine so that they feel confident in getting the vaccine themselves and in recommending the vaccine to their patients. And that's really what our focus, um, a big focus of our work will be this year. Absolutely. Leading with education and transparency is so key. Uh, how about you, Jen? Uh, what is the Bridgeport Clinic doing in terms of helping patients secure the vaccine appointments? Because that can be a barrier at times as well. So to Edith's point, we've been doing a lot of education, um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, visits. Every single patient that we're having in a telehealth appointment or a face-to-face -face appointment, we're making sure we take the time to ask and um, answer questions about the COVID vaccine. Um, we're seeing other challenges too. Technology is an issue, being able to navigate through the system, learning how to you know, use an email for some of our patients. That's, that's a pretty big deal and a lot of them don't have them. And mostly their kids are using the technology for school, but they themselves have never been taught. So one of the things we have done here is um, help patients over the phone with the telehealth system, 
um, try to navigate and get those appointments online. Um, we've even brought patients in and helped teach them how to set up an email and navigate through the VAM system to get appointments. And then up until recently, um, we reached out to all our community partners expressing how important this is for our, for our clients here at AmeriCares and why it's so important for them to have the vaccine. And nobody disagrees with that. But the trouble that they're having getting access to. And the local health department actually partnered with us and we did our first mobile vaccine clinic here in the clinic this Sunday. And it was a huge success. You know, our patients to eat its point we talk to them, we trust them. This is a place that they're comfortable. So being able to bring the vaccine here where they already know how to get to, where they already know the staff, where they already have a level of confidence and something that they're already scared and hesitant about um, really helped us get a high success rate. That's amazing. Um, we have a follow-up question from the audience here. Uh, this one is for Jen and Dr. Perkins. As frontline healthcare workers, what were some of the challenges you both faced treating patients during the pandemic? Jen, we'll start with you. So for me, COVID has changed the face of nursing forever. Um, I think the most challenging part for me, and I'm sure my team, if you talk to them, will tell you, is physically being present and the power of touch. You know, you learn as a nurse to be compassionate, how to be present, how to be there, that a power of a touch of a back of a hand or a pat on the back goes a really long way. And COVID has been very trying for a lot of our patients. Going through COVID themselves, loss of job, loss of family, frustration of homeschooling and figuring out what that is. Um, so, not being able to, to have that physical connection has been very challenging and has taught us that we needed to learn all over. And so um, that for me has been the most challenging part. Amazing. And Dr. Perkins, how about yourself? Yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak to it as an emergency physician, perhaps, you know, just like Jen said, I think that loss of connection uh, wearing PPE, doing a lot of the interview over the phone or via video, um, really, you know, took a, took a hit on the doctor-patient relationship. And then also as we move through various phases of the pandemic, you know, going from the thought of who has COVID to, well, everyone has COVID until proven otherwise. And now we're, you know, as we, people are starting to get vaccinated and you know, now it's sort of, well, somebody may have COVID and, you know, we need to, you know, use PPE for that and we should think about it. So it's, it's just, uh, it's sort of been challenging navigating those two aspects. And I, I think Jen hit it on the head, the, the loss of the personal connection, which we're starting to get back as we are using PPE in a sort of more judicious manner um, is, you know, was probably the biggest toll. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, how have you found that telemedicine or telehealth uh, affected the doctor-patient relationship for you? You know, that, that's a very common question that we're receiving here. Well, I, I just think that, you know, when you're able to be in the room with the patient and you're at the same time, you're asking them questions about whatever their health issue is, or maybe something unrelated about their family or et cetera, and then you're examining them and you really just get a, I think, a much uh, clearer picture and, and establish a better, you know, trusting relationship with the patient. Um, I, you know, and I'm hopeful we're going to start to get that back. And I'm seeing it already in the emergency department and I believe in the clinics as well, um, you know, a, as we move move to hopefully the, this phase of the pandemic, which is a little less uh, taxing than the, the last one. Completely agree with all of those points. Look, thank you so much to the panelists for making the time today, uh, chatting really important topics that I think people are eager to learn about, hear about your experiences as individuals in your respective specialties and fields. Ida, thank you so much for the amazing work you've been doing at the top of the spectrum. Jen, working in the front lines along with Dr. Perkins, really being there for patients. Um, AmeriCares, the donors, everyone that's playing an impact here. Obviously, we, we can't go through National Volunteer Week without thanking our volunteers. 
thank you so much for the amazing work and contributions that you've given. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic has been an unprecedented time with uh, a lot of surprises thrown our way. And I think throughout our conversation today, it's really highlighted how we've all had to come together and adapt. And I think AmeriCares is a prime example of when you care and you're passionate, you can truly do some amazing things for uh, other amazing humans. Because at the end of the day, whether we're doctors, nurses, specialists, we're humans. And I'd like to thank again, everyone for tuning in today. I hope everyone has a, a great end of their day and I wish everybody to stay happy and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.